Hello and welcome to Fed Up this day. Thank God you can make it. I'm super excited at what the Lord is doing in your life. And I know today you will walk in the fullness of the blessings of God. And that's not just for today, but all the days of your life. You are the blessed of God. You are the ransomed even of the Lord. Welcome to Fed Up today. I have a word today that I believe will transform you. I believe is a word that you need for it now uh, that will help you walk in the reality of the fullness of the blessings and the gift of God. Many times it's not that God does not give his gift, it's that we do not know how to walk in alignment with him in order to fully maximize the gift of God even in our lives. Uh, God's gift is in your home, is in your life, uh, is in your neighborhood. Uh, the, fuck, the question is, are you maximizing that gift uh, so that you can walk and reap the fullness even of the blessings thereof? Uh, today, I'd like to share with you what is, I believe is paramount in the mind of God. Can we read 2 Timothy? And then we read verse 2 Timothy chapter 1. I want to consider the words of Paul to his protege, his son, uh, Timothy. You just take two verses of that and then I'll be able to share the mind of the Lord with you. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and then we read verses 6 to 7. Bible says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God. Paul says, I remind you. That means he had had that conversation with him before. He said, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So how did the gift come? The gift came through the laying on of hands. But he says, I remind you to stir up the gift. Verse 7 says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God has not uh, given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Note that word for, right? Today, for a few minutes, I'd like to share with you what I've tied to tear up the gift. Tear up the gift. Uh, Father, thank you, because the entrance of your word will give light, give understanding to us simple folks. Father, we've come to learn at your feet. I make my tongue the pen of a writer. And Lord, I write the word of life upon the spirit of your people. After now, make us better people. Let the purpose of sending your word be fulfilled, Father. And I declare, O oh God, that we walk in your mandate and in your calling for our lives. In Jesus' name, and amen, and amen. I believe that 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 to 7 is one of the most crucial and most powerful passages of scriptures. Uh, and, I, and I love it. And I'll tell you three reasons why I do. The first one is that Paul gave a formula for maximizing and living in the fullness of God's gift. Uh, in that portion of scripture, God, Paul gave us a, a, a formula for living and maximizing even God's gift for our life. And what did he say? He told the young man to stir up, stir up. And then number two, he showed us that fear never comes from God. You know, one of the greatest issues our world is facing presently is the issue of fear. And many times we want to look at the source of fear. In fact, when doctors want to treat you for high blood pressure, they want to know, they ask you questions because they want to know what is the source of your anxiety, trepidation, and fear. Uh, but the Bible answered a very important question for us and that is that fear never has a source in god fear never has a source from god anytime you are free be sure anytime you are afraid be sure that this is not from god and then number three he showed us what are the things that are their source in god so paul said listen fear does not have a source in god the fountain of fear cannot be traced to god but what are the things that can be traced to God? Paul gave us a clue, even in that portion of scripture that we read. Uh, Paul gave us a clue. And that's why I believe that that portion of scripture is very important. Uh, and this is great because Paul was writing to his son, Timothy. And I love his frankness. He told him quite frankly, uh, he said, stirring up your gift is your responsibility. He said, you had a gift that was in you by the laying on of my hands. All right. So the gift is in you, but it's not enough. He was saying, listen, there is a part you've got to play. And that seems to me to be the most important part. And it was that you have to stir up that gift. Paul was saying, I've helped you thus far. But I can't help you further. I can't take this journey further for you. You've got to understand that stirring up your gift uh, is your responsibility. And before the young man thinks, you know what, I'm on my own right now. 
Paul told him three things that are the source in God that also pertain even to our gifts. All right, so that's what I just want to share about today. Let's just jump into it and get what it is that Paul was saying. I like to broaden this. It's like a textual sermon. I'm just going to be referring again and again to that text of scripture so that you understand fully what Paul was speaking of. All right, if you go back to our text, uh, uh, first, um, Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 to 7, he said, Therefore, I remind you to stir up to stir up that that's the first thing he said i remind you to stir up that word stir up what does that word stir up what does it mean is the word ana superior uh and what does it mean it means to rekindle afresh uh it means to fan the flame off Paul was saying, you need to rekindle afresh. Every day, a believer must rekindle afresh uh, as it concerns that gift. It might be a spiritual gift. It might be an innate gift. Uh, it, might, it might be a skill that you have. Uh, but if you are not going to lose it or you are going to live maximally in the fullness of that gift, uh, there's something you've got to do and that is Anna superior. What is that? You've got to fan that flame of that gift. You've got to rekindle afresh. What does it mean? It means to stir up the fire, right? If you have ever been where they are roasting corn on the streets in Nigeria and they roast it with charcoal and all of that, and when they want to begin the fire, they, they light it under and then put coal on it and then they begin to fan it. They begin to fan it until the coal becomes red. The responsibility of the corn maker is that she must fan the coal until fire spread all over the coal. Listen, as that fire is put under the coal, so it is with God. God will put a fire inside of you, but that fire is not enough. That fire needs to be stirred up so that it becomes big enough even to consume. What does that word again? What does it mean? It means to resuscitate. It means to gain strength. Some of us have worked inside and give before. We've prophesied before. Some of us have taught before. Some of us look at our lives and we say, you know what? When I was in school, many years ago, this and this happened via and through my ministry. You know, the plan of the Christ is that our path should be as a shining light. It should be like the part of a just. It should shine more and more onto the perfect day. The past should never be better than the future or the present. God's idea is that it keeps getting better on a daily and on a persistent basis. God is interested in your life getting better. That's why he wants you to gain strength. That's why he wants to resuscitate that thing. If you have walked in that dimension before, you can walk in that dimension again. But how is it going to happen? It's going to happen by you doing Anna Supurio. You've got to stir up your gifts. Anna Supurio. You've got to stir up your gifts. Anna Supurio. You've got to stir up even your gift. You need to fan it to flame. You need to understand that that is not the responsibility of your pastor. It's not the responsibility of your bishop. It's not the responsibility even of the Holy Spirit. It's your responsibility. Uh, you need to study. You need to pray. You need to exercise your gift. You need to exercise your gift. Dear teacher, your gift is stirred by studying and by teaching. That's how you stir up your gift, by studying and by teaching. Dear manager, your gift is stirred by managing people. Dear leader, your gift is stirred by serving people. If you are called to be a leader or you aspire to be a leader in your workspace, in the church of God, in the kingdom, in a home, one of the important formula for the leader is that the leader must learn to serve. You must serve. That is how to tear up your gifts. Look for positions to serve. Look for opportunities to serve. Dear music person, your gift is stirred by using it. We are not ready for more of God except we are maximally using what we have. We are not ready for more except we are maximally using what we have. The secret to more in God is the maximization of the present. That's the secret to more in God. The maximization of the present. Look at what you have. 
Look at the resources the Lord has blessed you with, sir. Look at the gift you have. Look at the people around you. Dear teacher, dear counselor, are you counseling the people God has sent to you? Before you desire and you task for more and for greater fields in God, you need to maximally use uh, even what you have. The more you use the oil, the more the oil you will carry. You know, in the physical, the more you use an energy, the more that energy gets depleted. That's not the way in the spiritual. In the spiritual, the more you use an energy, the more it is replaced. Therefore, lack of use, we mean lack of oil. If you don't have a use for a oil, there will be no need for supply. You see, God only supply vessels that are being used. If you really want to step into more in God, then you must be available for God able to use you. We need to be on the lookout for how we can use our gift. In the body of Christ, there is a belief amongst many of us that God's calling is enough, uh, that God's vision is enough, uh, that God's gifting is enough, that God's dream is enough. Uh, but you see, that is not the way we need to look at it. We need to understand that what God gave us is a deposit. Uh, whereas we need to work with that deposit in order to increase it. Uh, the deposit of God's fire inside of your life must be stirred up. It must be fanned to flame uh, if you are going to live in the fullness uh, even of the blessings of God. Uh, know the calling the giftings are not the end of your race. They are supposed to be the beginning of your race. It's supposed to be the beginning. It's time to walk on your gift. In as much as you can detect that this is a gift I have, you've got to train yourself on it. You've got to study on it. You've got to focus on it and find opportunities, not only for expression, but for development of that gift. Because God's gift is given, not fully developed. Spiritual gifts don't come fully developed. They don't come fully developed. The gift to see in the realm of the spirit, uh, the gift of prophecy, uh, it doesn't come fully developed. The gift of sensing and knowing, uh, it doesn't come fully developed. Uh, but the more you use them, uh, the more you are able to appropriate and the more you grow in the sensing of that gift. Uh, God needs your cooperation if that gift to get better and better. Little wonder Paul still writing to his protege Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4 four verses since it said take it to yourself and to the doctrine he said continue in them he said take it to yourself many times we take it to others we are quick to just share the light on others little wonder when we are being preached to when we are being taught uh, we are looking at how relevant it is to the life of other people we are not focusing on ourselves and asking ourselves what do i need to do better how does this concern me? What do I need to change about my life? Paul told Timothy, say, take heed to yourself and to your doctrine. Dear believer, you must learn to take heed to yourself. What are you going to do with the gift of God? What are you going to do with, with, the, with the things that the Lord has blessed you with? Scripture says, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Paul was saying, and this is very strategic. Many times we think we are very quick to save those who hear us. But Paul said the only way you can save yourself and those who hear you is by first of all taking it to yourself. That means you first of all must get a saving before you can save others. Listen, dear friends, there is the gift of God upon your life. And what you must do is that you must tear it up. No one will do that job for you. You got to do it. And that's the idea when you read Colossians 4 verse 17, Paul was writing to, to Archippus. Uh, he said, and say to Archippus, take it to the ministry which you have received of the Lord that you may fulfill it. Their intercessor, the only way to fulfill that ministry is to pray. Is to pray. Is to begin to have notes and write it down prayer point uh, and begin to be on your knees and begin to pray for those things. Uh. Don't say, I will pray as the Spirit leads me. That's important, but you must also grow yourself. Grow yourself uh, to begin to pray certain things through. When you write them down, you pray them through. You need to pray until result happens. That's how to maximize your ministry. Say, so take heed to the ministry which you have received of the Lord. It is the primary responsibility of the believer as a recipient of God's gift to stir it up. It's your primary responsibility to stir it up. It's not my responsibility. 
I, I was trained uh, uh, in a lorry under Reverend George and the truth is that, that I wasn't the only one who was trained. I wasn't the only one who subscribed for training. But, but I saw certain people come in and they did not they did not understand the truth that you have to take it to yourself. You, it's not the man of God. It's not that the pastor can preach well. It's not that the pastor is not, it doesn't have so much fire. It's that the spiritual race must first be a race you are ready to run. If you are not ready to run it, no matter the revelation shared, it won't bless you. It won't transform you. I found out that many people are enlisted in ministry. Many people are enlisted in life, but only a few show up on a daily basis. You've got to show up on a daily basis. You've got to tell yourself, I'm going to develop myself. I'm going to develop my gift. If you are, if you can code, you can write. Um, if you are a content writer, you are a social media manager, you must look for ways and avenues to develop yourself in these areas. It's not rocket science, but you've got to understand that this you have to take it to yourself you have to take it to your ministry gifts may come through the laying on of hands but it must be steered by the recipient it is not that god cannot use us it is that we haven't kindled our gift can i say to somebody again steering up your gift is your responsibility i'm teaching on steer up your gift it's your responsibility greatness will continually be a mirage Except and until we are ready to pay the price. Uh, your gift demands a sacrifice. Uh, and so here is the first agency of, of for steering up. The first agency for steering up the gifts, like Paul said to Timothy, is you. Paul was telling Timothy, if you fulfill your ministry, then it's you. It's you. The man in the mirror is, is the recipient of the gifts. And therefore is responsible for however their life pans out. I tell folks that if you are above the age of 30, you no longer have a victim. You no longer have someone who you can blame for your results. You do no longer have somebody you can blame even for how your life turned out. It's no longer your parents' fault. It's no longer anybody's fault. It's no longer the nation's fault. It becomes your fault. Because you've had 30 years to try new methods, 30 years uh, to channel your own course, uh, 30 years to lead your own life. Uh, and you've got to understand uh, that if we do not take responsibility for our lives, uh, then we will not transform our lives. I found out that without responsibility, people make excuses. Uh, if you don't want to keep making excuses, then you have to take responsibility for your outcomes. Uh, you shouldn't live in fear. And that's the second thing that Paul showed us. And let's read that portion of scripture again. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying out of my hands. He said, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. Right? One of the key damages, uh, that one of the key agents uh, against our gift is fear. The fear that you are not good enough. The fear that you will never measure up. The fear that you will get it wrong. You just want to prophesy for the first time. Or the Lord showed you something. I remember I, last week I was speaking with a lady over the phone. And, and I, as I was sharing, I, I, I talking to her, the Lord just began to reveal certain things to me. And I, I wanted to tell her how that, um, the things that happened to her in church, how she now is not free in church, how she doesn't like people in church anymore and all of that. The Lord shared all of that with me. And before I began to speak, there was fear. The fear of what if you get it wrong? What if she says nothing like that happened? What, what if all of that? But you know, I, I was able to move above fear. I, and, I, and I told her, and she just started crying. Listen, dear friends, uh, you need to understand that fear will limit your life. Fear will limit the expressions of your gifting, sir. Your spiritual gift, your ministry gift, uh, until you learn to walk in faith and conquer fear. You will not walk in the fullness, sir even of God's plan for your life. Uh, there is such a thing as what if. Uh, what if I fail? What if it never happens? What if it never comes through? What if I start a church and nobody comes? Uh, what if I say I have, I, I'm called to full-time ministry and now I can't pay my bills? Uh, what if? Uh, what if uh, nobody believes in my ministry? What if I get it wrong? Uh, what if? There is such a, 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 an avalanche of what if. Such, such fear. There was a time I was researching about fear. And I found out that, that there are more than a thousand fears in the world. More than a thousand fears. People are just afraid of height. Some people are afraid of ice. Some people are afraid of water. Some people are afraid of even eating. 
You won't believe that. Fear will make you live less than what God planned for your life. I, I like to tell you today that if you are going to live in victory, if you are going to see the full expression of that gift, uh, some of us have started businesses and we are still afraid to, to go on in. We are afraid uh, to give ourselves fully into it. We are afraid to tell somebody about the vision God has shared with us because there is that fear of what if that never happens. I've come to remind somebody today that fear is a limiter. If you are really going to work in the fullness of God's plan, you must let go and you must keep fear. Now, Paul says something in, in verse 7 that is very key. He says, has not given unto us the spirit of fear, then he mentioned the things that God has given us. These are the things I call the God dimension for stirring up your gift. If you are going to live in the fullness of the gift of God, you've got to understand these dimensions. How do I know these things are linked together? Look at this portion of scripture. Bible said, therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. And then he said, for God has not. For is an indicative word that speaks about the purpose and the reason. All right. Uh, I am coming to Ibadan for I have a ministration. All right. So why am I coming? Because of the ministration. So it speaks of the intent and the purpose. That's the word for. It's indicative. It tells you it's indicative of purpose and reason. All right, the Bible says, uh, therefore, I remind you, stir the gift which is in you. He said, for God has not given us. Uh, that means there is a reason God gave us this gift. Uh, the purpose of giving this gift has something to do, the, the purpose of God giving you these three things has something to do with your gifts. It has something to do with your gifts. It, it's indicating, it, it's, it's the reason. All right, the end of it is that, you can do this. Okay, so he spoke about gift. He spoke about stirring up your gift, which you already have. So you already have gift. You're listening to me. You already have gift of God. All right? And then Paul says, listen, he's not giving you spirit of faith. As it concerns that gift, uh, the, the intention is this. Uh, and then he told us what the Lord has given us. And these are three dimensions. Uh, he said he has not given us all the spirit of fear. And then the first thing he said is, but he has given us all the spirit of power, of love. I don't understand my so he's given unto us power, all right. Um, that's one thing he has given unto us. Uh, uh but it, it's not a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And so we want to look at those three dimensions because if you have to operate with those three dimensions, if you are going to stir up your gift and you are going to live in the fullness of what God has called you to be. Somebody say, you know what, I'm an intercessor to the nations. Glory to God. If you really want to become all of that, then you need to listen closely to the things I want to share with you. Somebody say, you know what, I'm called to be a pastor. I'm called to teach. I'm called to write songs. I, you know, I, I'm called to start businesses. That's beautiful. Somebody say, I'm called to make money. I'm called to, 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 to make money and then return it to the kingdom. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Whatever it is the Lord has called you to do. Somebody say, I'm called to cancel folks. I'm called to, to stand on the rampart, to speak for the church, to defend the truth. Whatever be, I'm called to manage. Whatever it is you are called to do, these three dimensions have to be unlocked if you are going to work in the fullness uh, even of what God has called you to do. So the first thing is that you have to take responsibility for your life, right? You need to take responsibility for steering up. Uh, and then you also, you, not your pastor, you, not your father in the Lord, you, not looking for mantles, you must, uh, must understand, you must align with these three things. Number one, understand you must align with the power dimension. Uh, the word power used in that verse is the word dunamis. Uh, we speak of power that recreates itself. Uh, he speaks of ability to perform. He, he talks about power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. Power residing in a thing by the virtue of its nature. So when we talk about dunamis, we're talking about the power that resides in God by the virtue of God's nature. By the virtue of God's nature. Now, as it concerns the believer, what is the implication via because of that definition? It means that the power that resides in the believer, because God now resides in the believer. So the believer has the nature, the virtue of the nature of God inside of him. Therefore, there are certain powers uh, that the believer can also work and operate in. Uh, because that virtue, that nature power is in the nature of God. That means his residence in God. God does not have to pray to be powerful. God is already powerful. God does not pray, need to pray to be good. Uh, God is already good. So when we talk about dunamis, we're talking about that nature, that virtue. 
of power that resides in God. But because now you are a child of God and you have become the temple of God and the spirit of power now dwells on your inside, there is a virtue of God that is now on your inside. It is the same power that gives us the power to perform miracles. It's the power to perform miracles. The power of God is available for the believer to operate his or a spiritual gift. All right? Understand the reason it is called a spiritual gift is because the source is of the spirit. That's why it's called the spiritual gift. Huh? Therefore, whatever is the source of a thing will have to power the thing. All right? So you need the power dimension of God if you are going to power your spiritual gift. Your spiritual gift does not come and does not become manifested or does not come, become steered by you just jumping around. No, it's by you becoming spiritual. The energy your gift runs on is dynamism. It's the power of God. That's the energy that your gift runs on. You've got to therefore cooperate with God if you are going to optimally use your gift uh, which is of God. Without him, you will not be able to use it well. Understand that the maximal operation of your gift is dependent on God's power. The more of his power you walk in, the more functional your gift is. The more functional. Therefore, power is important. Power is not an option for the believer. If you are going to see your gift be manifested, then you've got to get power. You've got to get into power. You know, some of us, the way we talk about power, we say, you know, I just need the word of God. I just need this. I don't really need the power. Oh, God, you need the power. Every one of us need the power because it is the power that will convict. It is the power that will help you teach with persuasion. It is the power that will let the Spirit follow every word that you speak. It was, you know, Paul that was saying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, he said, our gospel did not come to you in word only, but in power. In power. Your gospel needs power. Everybody needs power. The intercessor needs power. The businessman needs power. The teacher needs power. Every one of us needs the power of God. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and then you shall be witnesses. 24, 49, Luke, he told the disciples, he said, tarry in Jerusalem till you be endued with power power from on high and we know that when the day of pentecost had fully come the spirit of the lord came upon them and then they were baptized in power the, the what happened in pentecost uh, uh what happened at, in pentecost at the upper room was an immersion into power dear friends if you are going to walk in the gift of god you need an immersion in power in an immersion in power oh power comes via fellowship Power comes via prayer. Power comes via faith. You've got to have faith to just move. When God inspires you, the gift of wisdom, you've got to do when he tells you things, the gift of knowing, you just know things. You, you, you need faith to just step off. Faith to step off. Oh, build up yourself on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. How do I stir up my gift? How do I stir up my gift? By praying the Holy Ghost. Because prayer is important. The more you pray, the more you access and you stay with God. The more you stay with God, the more you rub in on you. The more the spirit man is built up so that you can manifest fully and boldly God's gift upon your life. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Then you have power. It's inside of you. But you've got to stir him up. You've got to pay attention to the man on the inside. You've got to pay attention to the spirit on the inside. Power comes via prayers. That's how power comes. Psalm 104 verse 13. It is the spirit of the Lord and his power that helps us even to create new things. Listen, dear friends, power is not an option. I don't know how to tell believers that enough. Power is not an option. There, there, is, no, there is no option. There is not, not talk of viable option. There is no any kind of option. No other kind of option for the believer but power. Is the reason Jesus warned them to tarry. For you need power. It's not an option. It's not something, if I don't have that, I can have other things. You need power. That's the power dimension. That's what will help you on the inside. That's what God has given you to stir up the gift. A man who does not have the power of God will not live in the fullness of a spiritual gift. You have to have the power of God. Every morning you must pray, Lord, empower me. Dunamis, O oh God. Dunamis, O oh God. The power dimension. The, the virtue innate in God that is now in me, the virtue inherent in God that is now in me, let it be lived out through me. 
Let it be manifested in our life. The power of God, the ability of God, the ability that resides in him. Let it be expressed through me. When a man lay hands on the sick and the person gets healed, it's not the man. It's the power of God that gets manifested through him. That's dunamis. That's dunamis. When a man tells you what has, to, what has taken place before now, that's not him. That's the power of God. When via prophecy, your life is pushed forward, that's not the man. That's the power of God inside of him. When you get into a boardroom and everybody seems confused and, and a wave just comes, a wave of an idea, that's not you. That's God. You need to tell yourself, I'm going to walk in the power of God. It was one of the things I ensured. I, I mean, I told God, except you empower me, I'm not ready to do ministry. I mean, it was something I passed after. It was something I knew that without it, it is worth nothing. The gospel without power is worth nothing. It's worth nothing. It's worth nothing. Jesus even said, these people will not believe. He said, this is signs and wonders. Power is important. Then number two, love dimension. By this, Paul speaks of agape. And what was he talking about when he speaks of agape here? He was talking about goodness. He's speaking of divine love. It's speaking of goodwill, affection, love which embraces the truth. You know, it is not love when it denies the truth. That's not agape. Agape does not deny the truth. Agape loves and embraces the truth. It is the love that is enkindled in us by the Holy Spirit. That's the love that can help us and inspire us to walk in the gift of God. And you will see the correlation as we proceed. You see the correlation as you produce, pro pro progress. One fundamental of working in your gift is to work in love. The more you practice working in the love of God, the more you are fanning the flame of your gifts. You want to work in the love of God? Work, what, want to see your gift manifested? You want to be a voice in your generation? Work on your love work. That's how to do it. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2, Bible says, Therefore be imitators of God as their children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and given, and given himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savour. He said, be imitators of God as their children. And what is the example that God showed us? He showed us by walking in love. Not that we first loved him, but that he loved us and he gave his son for us. Who did not come and die unwillingly, but willingly because he loved us. He loved us. Therefore, he gave himself. Not that the father gave him. He gave himself for us. Listen to this. I, when God told me this, this, when God shared this with me this afternoon, he was very telling. This morning, he was very telling. He said, lack of love will turn your burning flames to dying embers. Lack of love will turn your burning flames to dying embers. I've seen people who are on fire for God. Or just a little resentment. Just a little offense. And then they keep going down, keep going. And they did not know it. They have become embers right now. What are embers? Embers are residues of a coal. When you see a coal that's supposed to be red, it has turned to white. That, that, that means it's become an ember. Flaming fires have become dying embers because of lack of love. Because we do not walk in love, we hinder the move of the Spirit through our life. Love is the channel through which God's gifts flow. Love is the channel through which God's gifts flow. Maybe you don't need more prayers. Maybe you just need to work on your love life. Love is the basis through which all of God's best blessings flow. It's the basis. It's the basis. Sometimes it's not that there can't be expressions for your gift, but God has not found your love work worthy. He's, that's why he hasn't opened doors for you. The secret to an inner flow in the supernatural is to walk in divine love with everyone. To just love people. To, to, to be kind. Don't forget the definitions of that word agape. To be good. To, to, to be affectionate. A love which embraces truth. You know, it is not love when you lie to people. That's not love. Love is telling them the truth. You, you won't use your gift well. You won't function well except you love people. It takes love to give to others. And that's what the word gift is, to, to give what you have to others. It will take love. When you are tired, you are canceling. When you are tired, you are still speaking. Though you are, your, your, your bodily 
your, your body is, is, is weaker, you are still making people strong. It takes, it takes divine love. It takes divine love to do that, to, to empathize such as to, to ask that the virtue of God will flow through your life, uh, to, to, to sympathize uh, such as to, to want to give and help somebody and soak up somebody even in their pain. It takes love uh, to be relevant uh, even in God's scheme of things. It takes love. It takes love. And then finally, number three, we, Paul, Paul mentioned, he said he has given unto us spirit of, he's given unto us power, he's given unto us love, and then he said number three, and love is important. Romans chapter 5, verse 5, Bible says, love of God is shed abroad in our heart, even by the Holy Ghost. And then this is, this is very good. He, he said number three, he, he said sound mind, sound mind. Now, perhaps this is the most understated uh, and most uh, underrated part of stirring up your gift, especially in the body of Christ today. We speak so well about power. I mean, this is not the first time you are probably hearing this. I said about power. And maybe these days we are trying to speak also about love and all of that. But we are a little concerned about the mind. But Paul says sound mind is important in stirring your gift. If your gift will be fun to flame, if it will become what God expects it to become, if you are fully going to maximize the resource and the deposit of heaven inside of you, Paul said you've got to understand something. You've got to work on your mind. You've got to work on your mind. You've got to work on your mind. The, the word, the word, that means outside word, they concentrate on the mind. But the church doesn't want anything to do with the mind. I mean, there are many books on psychology, uh, on, on, on social intelligence uh, out there. Uh, so many books on, on how the mind works. Uh, many books that, that, that on how you can operate your gift, uh, teaching you on the values and the principles that govern the mind and the soul out there, right? And that's what the word concentrates on. Uh, 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 but, but Paul told us the three formulas. We, we shouldn't concentrate on one. We should concentrate on that part that is of power, which is the power that is only God that has it. I mean, it's only God that can propel it. Was Carnegie that was sharing in his book, I Think and Grow Richer. And he said he has found out that no one can become wealthy and successful without access to a power. All right, there has to be power. And that power is resident in every believer, even in you right now. You've got to just channel your life in such a way that you are allowing that power to flow and have expression through you. And that's very key. And then the second thing he shared about was love. And I believe that love is very key. If there's something missing in our work, uh, it's not power, it's love. We've got to have work on love. And then this third one is so underrated. We don't talk about it in the church. In fact, we've kind of see churches that speak about the mind as churches that are carnal, as churches probably that have forgotten the assignment, which is to draw everyone to the body of Christ. But we forget that this is in scriptures. Paul spoke about a sound mind. And that word he used there is the word sophronismos. sophronismos. And that word sophronismos is actually is a compound word that also has a source in wisdom. Uh, which is proness, it's a sophronismos, right? Uh, and uh, he, he was trying to share with us. Uh, and this word, the meaning of these words is very powerful. And this is why I want to tie this whole sermon up together today. I mean, you are not going to maximally use your gift in ministry, use your gift in life without sophronismos. Uh, and I believe that the greatest call of God in this generation is the call to sophronismos. What does this word mean? There are three key words that are in this word. And the first one is self-control. The second one is self-discipline. And the third one is prudence. Oh, how much of this do we need now as the body of Christ? And there is an admonition, a calling. God is calling us to soundness of mind. He's calling us to moderation and to self-control. And that's what that word means. He's calling us to moderation and to self-control. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, do not be conformed to this word, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul was writing to the Christians at Corinth, and he said, who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him. He said, but we have the mind of Christ. You see, the mind 
mind of Christ must, must possess sophronismos. It must be seen in somebody who has the mind of Christ. There must be self-control. It must be seen self-discipline. Prudence must be seen in somebody who follows the Christ. Isaiah 26 verse 3. Uh, he, he said he speaks about again the perfect mind, the peace of God. It must be in your mind. Listen, dear friend, uh, we need self-control. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, we are for guard of the lions of your lines of your mind. Guide of the loins. Sorry, let me read that again. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. He said, We are for guard of the loins of your mind. Guide it up. He said, put a garrison around your mind. He said, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We are for God of the loins of your mind. I said three things, self-control. Number two, self-discipline. And then number three, prudence. That word prudence, what does it mean? Because it's not the word we use regularly in our conversation. I really, I'm really, I'm, I'm really speaking to you and then you hear me say prudence and all of that. We probably use the word prudence when we talk about finances. But that word prudence, what does it mean? It means to be sensible. That's what it means. It means to be sensible. It means behavior that fits a situation. Uh, behavior that fits a situation. Behavior that fits a calling. Alright? Selling soap uh, to people is not sensible. And uh, you say they are going to be billionaires by buying it. It's not sensible. It, it just shows a lack of sophronismos. I mean, you are just feeding from people, selling anointing oil. It's not sophronismos. It, it's a behavior that is not fitting. Uh, what does that word prudence, what does it mean spiritually, scripturally? It means living out God's will by doing what he calls sound reasoning. Living out God's will by doing what he calls sound reasoning. The problem with many believers today is lack of sophronismos, lack, lack of self-control, self-discipline, and prudence. Lack, lack of sound mind, of moderation, of moderation, of moderation. Yeah, they, it's not wrong for you to wear jewelries, but how can a man of God be using seven rings? I, it, it, it's lack of moderation. It's lack of sophronismos. This is an important ingredient. If you be all that God has called you to be, you need to do all things in moderation. Eat in moderation. You cannot be obese. Somebody has a gift of God, you are obese because you are eating too much. Let everything be in moderation. When you come into some people's house, houses and you see the food in front of them, you see lack of moderation. Because if they eat half of that food, they will still be full. They will be fine. But there's lack of moderation. Is it reasonable? To date a lady for six years. Is it, is it, is it sound reasoning? It's, it's like, again, lack of sophronismos. How, how? Why? If you are going to stir up your gifts, you need sound mind. You need sound mind. Is it reasonable to go on visitation after 10 p.m. in the house of an opposite sex? Is it? No. No. You see, one of the things that separates us from animals is self-control. It's self-control. Animal nature is shown through unbridled, uncontrolled lust and desire. When you see a dog in it, it's chasing. It's just chasing. Whether it's in public or not, it's in it. Uncontrolled. Is it, is it reasonable, man of God, that you'll be touching girls in your teenage ministry? Is, is, is it reasonable? It's a lack of self-control. You, you are married. You have a wife at home. You can just wait and go and touch your wife or do anything you want to do. But it's, it's, it's lack of sophronismos, a lack of self-control. And this is a call. It's a call to self-control. It's a call to moderation. It's a call to self-discipline. It's a call to prudence. Sensible. A person will not fulfill his ministry nor maximize his gift who lacks moderation and self-control. That person cannot fulfill his ministry. It can't happen. And you know, when we talk about these things, people think we only talk about vices. Even in your show of affluence, even in your show of wealth, self-control. Yes, we know you have three G wagons and you have many Jeeps and all of that. You don't have to show everything at the real. It's not, it's not important. It's not important. There has to be moderation. There has to be moderation in everything we show. Perhaps the loudest cry of wisdom in the church today is for moderation. Perhaps... The loudest cry 
of wisdom in the church today is for moderation. Can we do things in moderation? How can we do things in moderation? Many times we just like vying off the road, vying off the road. The way we speak sometimes, the things we pray, the, the, our prayer point, the things we talk about, how we abuse other people, how we try and correct other people shows lack of moderation. Even in our words, lack of moderation. What wisdom is shouting is for moderation. Moder There's a way you, you are so happy in your church that you jump in praise and worship. You are all so loose that it looks like a clubhouse. Because there's no moderation, there's no decency, no order. And 1 Corinthians 14, 40 says everything must be done with decency and in order. We've got to understand these are the truth of scriptures. You see, many of us, it's not that God has not given us gifts, but we have, we have no sense. There's no sense. There's, there's no sense. There's just, there's just no sense. And this is important. And that's what Paul was speaking about. He says he has given unto us sound mind. A believer is supposed to be shown and known via sound decisions, rational decisions, sound mind. A sound mind is a mind capable of rational thought and decision making. When I see the way some pastors carry themselves, do the things some, peace, some, some prophets say, I just say to myself, this, there's no sound mind here. Have they met with the Christ? If they have, then they will show sound mind. You will see rational thought, rational decision making. As a believer, can we look at your life and say this is an example of the Christ? That this shows that you have the mind of Christ according to 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16. Can we see that in your life? When we look at your decision making, the kind of person you want to marry, the kind of things you are doing, can we say this is sound mind? In scripture, a sound mind means to act in line with God's will. To act in line with God's will. What is God's will for our finances? What is God's will for our marriage? What is God's will for raising children? What is God's will for the church? What is God's will for our jobs? What is God's will for our character, our nature? When we live out this God's will, it's cause and mind. And we are reasonable in our thought and in our ways. It is the ability to discern what is good for our soul and what is harmful. It's sound mind. Sound mind to know that smoking, I don't have to, I don't have to take, you know, I, I don't have to even buy a cigarette and look at the back and say, and say smokers are liable to die young. I don't have to do that. It's the ability to know what is harmful and what is good for my soul. I don't watch, I don't, I, I'm married, but I wouldn't watch a blue film, for instance. I won't watch pornography. You know why? It's destructive. It takes sound mind to know that's wrong. That's wrong. It takes sound mind to know that if you, you can you can are prophesying and collecting money from poor people, it's sound mind to know that is wrong. You know, you have the Holy Ghost. Yes. But not every time you are waiting for Him. Because you are in tandem. You are working in line with scriptures. So the spirit inside of you has been built up to resist foolishness. It has been built up to resist folly. So you know, this is not good. This is not what to do. This is what to do. It's wrong. It's wrong. I must maximize my gift. It's wrong to have this gift and to do nothing about it. It's not sound mind. It's not sound. It's not sound. Are you, are you, are you, do, do you understand those are the three gifts God has given us? Do you understand? I mean, this looks like a very unusual message, but it, it, it's the truth. It, it, that, that's just me explaining what our test says. That's just me telling you what our test says. That sharing up your gift is not abacadabra. You've got to you've got to put in the work. You've got to put in the sacrifice. It's your responsibility. And then I've shown us that we cannot afford fear to come in. And then there are three things that God has deposited inside of you. And it must be shown in your place of work. That's how your gift will show. Sound mind. Sound decision making. Diligence in your business. How you carry yourself. That's how they know you've got sound mind. Sound mind. You just made a profit of two million naira, or you made a profit of one million naira. You want to buy a car? I mean, that's not sound mind. That's folly. That's folly on four wheels. You just ask yourself, what am I doing? What am I trying to do? What am I trying to achieve? Would that is that what the Christ in me demands, or am I trying to live up to the expectation of the world? This how we be wise people. I'm tired of believers who are foolish. We've got to make sound decisions. We're going to make wise decisions. The corridors of the church should be called the pillar and the ground of truth. We have made it, we have messed up everything. Why? Because 
there's a, an apparent lack of sophronismos. And it's time. It's time for believers to begin to demonstrate wisdom. To begin to demonstrate sophronismos. Self-control. Self-discipline. Prudence. And you know what that means? Being sensible. Bow down your head, bow down your heart. And you're going to say to God, Lord, I'm going to be sensible. You know when people say, be sensible, it sounds like an abuse. But I've shown you in scriptures that that's what that word sound mind, that's what it means. It means prudence. It means prudence. Lord, I'm going to make sound financial decisions. I'm going to make sensible decisions. You know, many times when we talk about being moved by the will of God, or following the will of God for our life, or hearing God, or the Lord leading us. Many times, 80% of the time, you are supposed to be led by a sound mind, by sophronismos. That's the way we are supposed to be led. Somebody pray and tell God, Daddy, I make sound decisions. Daddy, I make sensible decisions. Somebody say, I'm not supposed to make decisions that make sense. I'm supposed to make decisions that... No, no, no. You are given a brain by God. If the day you are born again, you don't need it. You have taken it away. You need it. The three has to come together uh, to make a complete man. To make a complete man. If you, if you smell, you smell petrol and you drink it, say, I didn't know in my spirit. You are supposed to be sensible. That's, that, that's the gist. So you are supposed to live via your sense also. Somebody say, I make sensible decisions. I, I make wise decisions. Are you praying? The second half of this year, you will not be a victim of folly. Of folly. The second half of this year, I will not be a victim of folly. I will not be led wrong by my appetites, by my, by my desires. I, 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 I make decisions that are controlled. I live a life of moderation. I live a life of moderation. I live a life of moderation. The reason believers today look like the world is an apparent lack of moderation. That's how our services, our lifestyle look like the world. It's an apparent lack of moderation. Father, it's a call to moderation. Father, I will live a life of self-discipline. I will live a life of self-control. I will live a life of moderation. And how will you be able to do that? Somebody asks for the power of the Spirit. Somebody asks for dunamis. Somebody asks for dunamis. The power of the Spirit on your inside, man. Ask for the power of the Spirit. Thank you, eternal King of glory. Adonai, we exalt you. We give you glory. We give you praise. Thank you because we are going to stir up our gifts. We are going to work on, on every gift you are giving us. Our skills, our, in it, our spiritual and our hidden gifts, our learned skills, our learned gifts. We are going to use them for your glory. We are going to fully maximize them by your help. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. And amen. And amen. And so, and that's paid off for today. Um, I'd like you to to continue to the things you have heard, the things you've read, uh, you've written down, please and please think about it. Uh, it is not the hearer of the word that is blessed. It is the doer that is blessed. I, I, I help, I, I pray that the Lord will help you to make sound decisions and to stir up even the deposit of God, even on your inside. May every ember right now, may they become fanning, may they become flaming fire. May every ember become flaming fire even in the name of Jesus. All right, this is Fade Up, and this is the end of Fade Up for today. I'd like to invite you specially to church this Sunday, this Sunday, this Sunday. It's going to be marvelous in the presence of God. I want to teach you on the power of the tongue. It's going to bless you. Uh, it's going to change your life. You have going to, it's going to show you how you can send away darkness and devils from your life. Uh, the power of the tongue. Many times we are the ones who open the door even for the visitation of darkness into our lives or the invasions even of demons into our lives. I want to teach you how to gain control and how to live a life fully empowered by the Spirit. Be in church, number 20, Isaac Alukolo, Street, Naira Bet, Head Office, in Wefon Leki, is where we presently are for this month. For this month. The Lord keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you. I'll see you on Sunday. Cheers. <music>